Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about China. We always need to study China, especially in these days of Indo-Pacific tension. Our guest for the show is Carl Baker, Senior Advisor of Pacific Forum. Welcome to the show, Carl. Good to be here, Jay. Always uh, interesting to talk about China and what they're up to these days and how the United States is interacting with countries in the region uh, to sort of protect themselves against what they see as a threat from China? Well, it sure seems like there's plenty of things that China is doing that are threatening. I mean, for example, uh, it's unprecedented overflights um, against Japan, as well as Taiwan, um, and its development of a larger Navy and military and weapons and domestically. And its economy, its trade and foreign policy relations with the U.S., which involves a, an active discussion with Jake Sullivan uh, over the past few days, mm -hmm. and the platforms of our presidential candidates on relations with China. It's, it's if, if we wondered whether it was still important, it's still important, isn't it? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, China. I mean, and and rightly so. China is seen as the as the new threat to uh, American primacy. You know, and I think that that's that's really where the debate is: is what does what does that mean for U.S. primacy? Is there is the strategy of the of a uh, Harris administration going to be much different than the Biden administration? And uh, and on how then how does that compare to to Trump to the point that to the extent that Trump has a strategy at all? I think um, Xi Jinping must have some preference here. Who? Who do you think he prefers as the winner of the November fifth election? You know, I'm, I'm I'm not so sure that that's an easy answer for Xi Jinping because I think, you know, he he, I think he ultimately I think it's Harris. I think that he sees Harris as being more stabilizing, where where Trump is is sort of a destabilizing force and and, and an unpredictable uh, character in in the international system, and I I honestly think that China would prefer to have a, a much more uh, stable kind of environment to operate in. That it's easier for them to operate in that environment. It doesn't mean that that Trump is beneficial to American interests, but it, it, I think that that if you're looking at it from from Beijing's perspective, you'd rather have someone that's at least predictable that has that has a a coherent group of people working with her to promote a particular strategy toward China, because it's easier to, 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 to determine. You know, I mean, one of the challenges of, of opposing Trump on anything is trying to figure out what his mood is going to be today. You know, I mean, with, without, without a, any, any strong sense of principle or, or direction, you always have to wonder what is, how is Trump going to react? Is it going to be some personal grievance, or is there going to be some something that he sees in his personal advantage that he's going to do? Where I, I think you know a Harris administration will be much more predictable, much more methodical in the way it approaches uh, the the China problem. Well, with that in mind, she sounds like a better bet for the country uh, to achieve um, you know stability to avoid. Confrontation with China, she sounds like a better possibility, not only for the U.S. but for the world. Oh, yeah, or, sure. Or yeah, I, I I agree. But you know, but it, it, the the attractiveness of a Trump to to Xi Jinping to to talk about that a little bit is that it will it will facilitate China's role as the primary. It will facilitate. China's primacy in the global system, because Trump is going to be much more isolationist, much more willing to to uh, dismiss allies, and ultimately be of the mind that the United States can alone confront China, where the Harris administration is going to be much more interested in developing a, a network of relationships, much like Biden has done, to confront China. So I think that that's that's sort of the judgment that somebody in China has to make is which one of those is better? Do you do you really? I mean, the the risk is the destabilization that you get with Trump, but 
that the benefit of a Trump is that you facilitate the demise of the United States. Yeah. Well, how does how does the uh, Chinese uh, support of Russia and, and uh, of course the gas and oil source from Russia play uh, into all of that? You know, they, of course they they want to be top dog. Um, they want to achieve primacy over the U.S. Um, they're supporting Putin, uh, and it's clear that if they didn't support Putin, he he'd have a lot of trouble in doing what he's doing now. Um, mm -hmm. So how does that play into the Ukraine war? I'm not sure I understand what you, what you're driving at here. I mean, how much how much does Chinese support of Russia benefit Russia in its in its fight in Ukraine? Exactly. A lot. Yeah, of course, a lot. Because, I mean, and, and it's not just China. It's China and India. And to some extent, the, the, the so-called global south, because they're tolerating Russia. And, and by tolerating Russia, by giving mar Russia a market for its, for its goods, obviously, it's sustaining Russia's capability to prosecute a war in Ukraine. So certainly China and certainly China is a the biggest factor there because they are the ones that that have have seen the largest increase in trade. They are the ones that are absorbing those natural resources out of Russia. They are the ones that are are providing materials for for Russia, not not military materials, but certainly other goods that are being traded with Russia. So clearly China is is a major factor in Russia's ability to continue prosecuting the war. Would you agree with me that if China stopped, if it changed its position on that, if it said we're not going to buy your oil and gas, we're not going to support you, uh, you know, on the world stage in your in your invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, then Russia, Putin would have to change its position. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think so. I mean, it, it's it's not it's not a a probably it's not a yes or no in my mind because I think that. That Russia has other outlets that it's been developing beyond China. Certainly, China is again a big factor. But don't forget, there's there's the Middle East. You know, they've been very active in trying to build a relationship with the with the countries in the Middle East, in Africa, and and again, India is certainly a player here. So yeah. so, but clearly, if if China would would make a very hard stance, saying no more support, you know, of any kind, no more no more. Uh, favorable uh, imports of, of oil and gas, it would it would certainly force Russia into uh, some serious considerations about how to how to extract itself from that from that. Well, one one big uh, piece of news is Jake Sullivan's three day trip where he actually met with uh, Xi Jinping mm -hmm. um, to hopefully improve relations between the U.S. and China. And I would like to discuss that. But before we get to that, you know, it's a sort of mm, describe of uh, the landscape here, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that should be covered. I mean, for example, um, the uh, the trial and conviction of two of the editors for from now defunct Stan News, which is a liberal pub publishing organization in Hong Kong, uh, and China's um, China's actions against the Philippines and the South China Sea, and its rhetoric against the Philippines, that's really heating up. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, you have China trying to get into the uh, electric vehicle market with the B BYD. That's a very good car. Um, and they're going to be selling it everywhere that, you know, doesn't impose tariffs. Canada and the U.S. are and will impose serious tariffs. Um, and their relationship with Elon Musk, which is uh, on again, off again. Uh, and so forth. There's, they're building up their military. They have twice the ships that we do, and they announced a hypersonic missile that could destroy one of our trillion-dollar carriers, like the Gerald R. Ford, uh, and other American ships. So they're pretty aggressive. You know, the balloon a year ago uh, was one thing, but after the balloon, they've been continuing. They've been continuing on gathering data on everybody, and Google has complained about that on uh, laying propaganda out through social media, and Google has tried to stop them on that. And uh, the fact that they were stealing AI secrets through uh, an ex-Google employee, 
uh, only a few days ago, and Google was not happy about that. But China is very aggressive on a bunch of things um, to you know, compete with and in many ways undermine uh, the U.S. hegemony. So that is, in my view, the background. Um, and the question is, why was Jake Sullivan there? What could he achieve? Well, I think what Jake Jake Sullivan is trying to achieve is is you know as as the news said some set some sort of guardrails on on what's really happened, you know. And I think yeah, all the stuff that's going on in, in the South China Sea and East China Sea with Japan, Taiwan, I think those are all all issues that are being addressed. Uh, I think they also apparently talked a little bit about uh, nuclear weapons, about whether it's time for an arms control discussion. You know, I think that, that all those things are, are being talked about. And, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the issues that you raised are, are interesting issues, and they're not exactly black and white, I think, that there's, there's what's going on in the South China Sea. It's interesting because there's a lot of confrontation with the Philippines, between the Philippines and, and China. But at the same time, what's happening is Vietnam is actually the most aggressive builder of artificial islands these days. They've been very active in building artificial islands, yet you see no interaction or no visible interaction between China and Vietnam over that activity. The only activity you, you hear about is the confrontation between China and the Philippines. And so I, I just point that out, that, that there seems to be something that is is creating this problem between the Philippines and China. Is it because the Philippines continues to call out the activity, the behavior, and, and doesn't really do much beyond calling out the activity so it gets it gets attention in the Western media? While while Vietnam, as I said, is clearly doing something, they're building their own artificial islands, they're developing uh, you know capacity to to station troops in the South China Sea. But it gets no attention in in the Western media, so it's kind of an interesting uh, consideration of what what really is going on. Is there is there is there a, a misinformation disinformation campaign that's part of this? Is there some reason why why China is just sort of looking the other way from what Vietnam is doing, or does Vietnam understand what China's position is, and they know that they can get away with this? Where the Philippines is is trying to trying to publicize it to to keep attention on on the Chinese behavior, uh, it's just a question I don't have an answer to, but it's an interesting uh, observation I think that there's something different between the Philippines and Vietnam and the way Russia or the way China is treating this to, or the way they're interacting with China on the uh, on 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 the on the Electric vehicles. I mean, I think it's clear to me both both you know both the United States and Canada are proposing 100 percent tariffs. And of course, the day that that Biden said 100 percent, Trump said 200 percent. You know, so so there's sort of an escalation here in the United States in the political rhetoric in the campaigns of what you know what's really happening. But I think it's pretty clear in the rest of the world. You know, B, as you say, BYD is is really a good electric vehicle, and and. China has done what they said they were going to do. They're going to capture the electric market. They've done it. They've, they've built the capacity. They've got the battery plants. They've got the, the raw materials. They're exporting these cars to Southeast Asia, to, to other, other parts of the world. Europe, I think Europe has, has uh, tentatively set what a, something like a 25, 30% tariff you know, trying to discourage them coming to come into Europe also. So, you know, it's it's almost become China versus the West in, in this electric vehicle market where the rest of the world says, hey, cheap electric vehicles, you know, and, and again, this plays to what I see as this constant narrative between China and, and the West that China is saying, look, we're just providing a public good here. We're provide we're providing cheap electric cars. We're promoting climate change. Now the United States because they got behind on us, uh, behind in this technology. Now they're crying foul, and they're saying we have to raise the tariffs because we we provided uh, we provided uh, uh, government subsidies to to make these cars cheap, you know. And 
And so, you know, that's that's the constant China narrative that you hear in the rest of the world. It's not the narrative that you hear in the United States so much because we we have our own narrative saying, you know, China's a cheater, China, China steals intellectual property, China has has is subsidizing these state-owned enterprises and all that. But I think in the rest of the world, the, the story is, well, you know, why is it that that we hear different stories from the United States about different different aspects of Chinese behavior. So I, I think that I, I would I would just point that out that that I think China is playing to the rest of the world more than it is to to the American audience. It does um, suggest the relationship of China with uh, the United Nations. Now China, you know, ignored the the ruling of the United Nations uh, on the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. and um, and left um, the Philippines high and dry on that. And I don't think we did a whole lot to uh, protect the Philippines on that. But now they seem to be interested in renewing their influence at the United Nations. Uh, is that part of the same process? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, they, they have, I think, you know, I think China, you know, in some ways they, they learned well from the United States that, said you know if you want to if you want to influence world affairs get involved in multilateral organizations and so china has been very aggressive in in getting leadership positions in un un organizations they've been very aggressive in the w you know since they joined the wto they've been very aggressive in getting leadership positions there look what happened with the who and, and covid you know they 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 were very influential in, in WHO. And, you know, and yeah, all over the United Nations, you see the, the Chinese being very, very aggressive in promoting Chinese Chinese uh, individuals into these leadership positions because they've come to realize that you, you have influence over these dis decisions being made in the UN. And yeah, they've, they've gone to the UN and they've, they've uh, provided attractive reasons for people to support their positions at the UN. So you see, you know, the whole the whole uh, problem with with human rights at the UN has now shifted to a, a discussion about, you know, what gives the West the right to define human rights, you know, and so yeah, so China has certainly recognized that and they're and they're trying to take advantage of it to the greatest extent possible, where they they're using that to to influence these multilateral institutions. And at the same time, they're building their own set of institutions to to compete with some of the institutions that were created under Bretton Woods. As you know, you know you have the BRICS, you have the, the, A, the uh, investment bank, you have BRI, the Bre uh, Belt Road Initiative. You know you have all those different initiatives that are also now competing with other multilateral organizations. So it's a it's a combined combined effort. No, no, I I, I was going to say something along similar lines, and that is. And that is, it's smart. This is smart. This is, um, we call it small, soft power or smart power, whatever. They're 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 mm -hmm. copying us, and and um, and I think they realize. I mean, it's obvious that the United Nations is um, what 192 countries, many of which do not support the United States. Right. So they they find a certain sympathy among many of the nations of of the United Nations. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what that's what I mean. They, you know, they've got they've got they've got two narratives. One one narrative is is to the West about the, about the grievance that they have, you know, the the hundred years of shame and you know and all this. And then the other narrative that they have is to the rest of the world. They're always very eager and ready to call out hypocrisy on on the West, you know, and 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 that feeds that feeds a narrative to the to the global South. What that nebulous thing called the global south, but there's a lot of countries, as you say, out there that that accept that and say, yeah, you know, you're right. You know, yeah, China here, they're providing cheap electric cars, and we get all this noise from the West saying that they're cheating. You know, well, what about all the all the stuff that we had to absorb when the West was uh, subsidizing their companies and putting them out here and extracting resources, you know, and so you, know, you can see how how that narrative plays well in, in certain parts of the world. You know, Carl, um, to go on YouTube, you see a, a really a flood of YouTube stories about um, the United States military, especially the Navy, uh, as against the, the Chinese Navy. 
And of course, some of it is going to be, I don't know, questionable in terms of accuracy. But there's so much of it that you have to take the threat seriously. And <clears throat> the uh, the YouTube videos I've seen seem to be credible um, for the proposition that China is building up its military um, to a point where it's way bigger than our military. Um, twice the number of ships and this, I mentioned this hypersonic missile that has the ability to destroy a, a trillion dollar carrier. Um, how much concern should we have about this? Because, uh, you know, we spend, the United States spends something north of $900 billion in the military budget every year. Are we keeping up with them? What can, what can we do about this? I'm a little bit skeptical about the, the military aspect. I mean, I, China has said that they want to develop a world-class Navy. And a world-class Navy means that you're going to have a blue water capability. So to have a blue water, to have a serious blue water capability, you have to be able to operate beyond what we talk about as the first island chain. In other words, beyond Japan, uh, Taiwan, the Philippines into, into the Pacific Ocean. And is that is that threatening to the United States? Well, only if you believe that that U.S. national interests are actually affected by that. Now, I mean, should that bother us that that China is is developing a, a blue water Navy capability? Uh, there's nothing inherent in, in that, that that should bother you unless you believe that that there's some motive beyond building this world class Navy. I mean, in some ways, you know, that may be good because it's they're spending a lot of money to do it. And, you know, yes, we spend a lot of money on defense and uh, maybe we should spend less because what is what do we get for all that money we spend? Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I think we, we really have to think about, you know, do we really want to put our money into into military capabilities when you look at, you know, what is the future of war? Is it really is it really big, sophisticated, expensive weapon systems? Or is it is it drones, you know, that you can build for for a couple thousand dollars that you can send in in massive fleets and uh, attack an aircraft carrier the same way you can with a hypersonic missile, you know? So I think yeah, you know, I I think that there's a lot of, of thinking that we need to do about military capabilities, and you know, and I know that that the Western media loves to parade out these numbers that the, that the, you know the Chinese now have three aircraft carriers and they're developing this 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 massive fleet of navy ships but on the other hand we complain about the way we waste money on these big legacy systems uh in the u.s navy so you know i think maybe maybe we have to say well okay they feel they need to build this this blue water navy or this this world-class navy well go ahead you know, and we'll continue to to provide some some deterrence against that that capability, whatever that is. But in the meantime, we really need to think about what is the future of war. You know, what is the future of of, of, of interstate conflict? Is it really big, massive weapon systems that are going to go bump each other in the in the night, or are they? Is it something on focused on information and disinformation, and and you know? artificial intelligence that uh, provides capabilities for cheap drones that can do uh, weapons effects that uh, hypersonic missiles can. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's such an important question. So that's why, you know, the, the media is reporting that this ex-Google employee was found stealing AI for China. Uh, that's why Google has taken down the influence campaigns that have been tied to, uh, to China, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Russia, and for that matter, Indonesia. But what we have here is an information competition uh, where our personal data is somehow leaking to China, where our cutting edge AI technology is somehow leaking to China. It wants to be, you know, the, the most advanced country in the world not only on the programming, but on the data involving you and me and everybody we know. And, and I'm wondering how the, you know, this helps to help, it helps us understand what they're really after. What are they really after, Carl? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure we have an answer. They, you know, in, in some ways, it's it, it's almost as blind as as United States interests are when it comes to global primacy. I mean, I'm not sure yet. You know, we all use the word global prim primacy, but what does that really mean? Does it really mean just simply that you have more influence, that you can you can act with impunity when you want to? And I, and maybe that's it. Maybe maybe that's that's the ultimate goal of primacy is to be able to act with impunity. You know, and that certainly is how the United States and China act in in the global system. That that as you said, you know, if China wants to ignore a ruling by an arbitral panel of, of UNCLOS, they can, because they are capable of acting with impunity and there's no consequences for that act. And, you know, in the United States, much the same way, they they want to be able to act with impunity. If they see something that, that they don't like, they want to be able to deal with it without having to worry about the International Criminal Court or, or other, the World Trade Organization. They want to be able to deal with it on their own terms, you know. So, so maybe that's maybe that's what China wants. They they see the United States as being able to act with impunity, and they say, well, that would be kind of nice for us to be able to do that too. And and in Hong Kong, you know, going back to your story in Hong Kong, that's what's happened. You know, they've said, look, we don't like this this liberal media that's that's saying bad things about the Communist Party. We're going to stop it because we can. And and again, it's an act of impunity. So you know, so maybe that's the goal. Maybe that is what they're after. They they see that as as an attractive part of being a, a a prime power. Now, of course, China will say we're not really interested in primacy in the way the United States has been interested in primacy. We just want to have our way in our part of the world. Or we want to have our say in things that really matter to us, in our national interests, whatever they may be. I'm not getting any closer to civil rights here. You know, freedom of the press is finished in Hong Kong. And, and that stands as um, an example for the rest of China. Um, if, if, they, if they see these editors being prosecuted, now convicted, and in September they'll be sentenced probably to substantial uh, long-term jail terms. I wouldn't say they're they're sending a message to the rest of the country. I think they're 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 saying this is the way it works in China. The rest of China yeah. already has that has has that knowledge, and so they're just introducing that to Hong Kong. I would put it in the reverse. The mm -hmm. people in China were saying, "Well, of course that. What would you expect? This is China." You know, I think that that <laughs> that what well, the message that's being sent, I think, is to Taiwan, saying, "Look, you do not want to accept one country, two systems." because that's what you get. You get one country. <laughs> so um, th thinking more uh, other issues about you know domestic events in China, there's been news uh, about how people didn't like the way they handled COVID. There's been news about how the um, economy is not doing all that well. And uh, I forget the name of the concept in China. Uh, and it goes along the lines, uh, if the leadership does not give you a decent economy, um, you, you have the right to turn it over. Domestically, uh, Xi Jinping has issues. Oh. And of course, when a, a given autocracy has issues, it, it looks uh, for somebody to blame. Mm -hmm. And um, some, of, some of their foreign policy that we've been talking about is probably very helpful um, on establishing, what do you want to call it, um, you know, a, a mission for people to be concerned about mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, dealing with um, uh, the U.S. and the West. And so that helps him in dealing with people who may be disenchanted in China. How how serious is the disenchantment, though? The economy, the civil rights, what have you? Well, yeah, I think they, they they do have problems, and you know, and and one of the big problems is overcapacity. You know that 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 when you do when you do industrial policy that promotes certain industries, you have a problem because what happens in China is is you have this 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 overcapacity that gets exacerbated because the central government subsidizes these these companies, other other 
provincial and city governments see it and they do the same thing and so you get a you get a self-fulfilling mechanism of overcapacity to the point where you know in some ways belt and road initiative was really designed to export that overcapacity and and it didn't necessarily work out that way it's it wasn't quite as easy as they thought it was going to be to export that that overcapacity but certainly that's a, it's a huge problem the other problem you have is, of course, the the uh, the demographic demise of China. That they are now down to a replacement of one of one point zero, you know, which uh, is is not sustainable. And so they have they have the young kids are not getting married, not having children. You know, they tried to reverse their one child policy, and it's not working. You know, and and so they they have a huge demographic problem of of you don't you're not replacing people who are who are dying and so you're you they're looking at population decline in the next in the next decade serious population decline much like the rest of asia and and they don't have a an immigration policy that's going to fix that you know even even japan and korea have gotten to the point where they realize they need to have an immigration policy to start addressing that problem china is a long ways away from that and you know and when you look at what's happening in China, you're not going to be too eager as an immigrant to be moving there, are you? You know, so so you know, so I see that as as another big problem. You know, but they they report, you know, uh, people under 25 an unemployment rate of over 20 percent. You know, so that's that's another problem. You've got you've got probably got highly educated kids because they're all single children, and they're unemployed. You know, so so that's that's another problem that you have to deal with. You have people who were educated overseas, they come back home, and suddenly they're unemployed, and they see this government uh, spending money on on big, expensive military equipment that doesn't seem to be doing them any good because they're living in in Shanghai without a job. You know, so so yeah, they've got a lot of problems, and you know, and I if you're if you're going to develop a U.S. policy. To combat that, I think you need to think about how do you exploit this problem, and and the, the way you do that, I think, is you work with countries in the region. You build you build alliances and and ec- not necessarily military alliances, economic alliances, and you build economic frameworks that force China back into that global system, that that then forces them to make accommodation to demands from outside and you take away some of that feeling of impunity that China has developed over this past decade. I was going to ask you that. What, what is the ideal relationship we should be seeking with our foreign policy? Um, is it is it uh, business competition? Is it, uh, you know, a military superiority? Is it a global influence? How should we, the United States, how should we see that? What should our target be in terms, that's a bad word. What what should our mm, uh, goal. ultimate goal be? Yeah. In, in terms of uh, you know establishing a useful, productive, uh, mutually beneficial relationship with China. And I think it is. It, it there's certainly there's a, a a degree of economic competition. I think we have to we have to recognize. You know, and and people have been saying this since you know, since the, the, I remember the, I think the first time it showed up was the 2010 national security strategy of the, the first Obama administration that talked about, you need to build infrastructure in the United States to educate people, to to get people acclimated to the new information society. You know, and this of course, it goes right back to the, the attractiveness of, of Trump grievance policies. Is is that you have left a, a huge chunk of your population behind, and so I think that that's where you need to start. We need to start by thinking about how do we develop a workforce that is actually viable in the global economy, and how do we how do we maintain that economic relationship with China that is mutually beneficial. The military competition, to me, is always going to be a drain on resources. I think we're much better off building a a stronger image of the United States to the rest of the world and, and compete with China in the rest of the world by develop by providing development assistance, financial assistance, integrating our, our 
the huge private capital that we have in the United States with an infrastructure program that that can actually be beneficial in the rest of the world. Ultimately, the rest of the, we're 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 both dependent on the rest of the world, and the, the better we provide an attractive model to the rest of the world, the better off we're going to be. And I think that's where the competition with China has to be, is, is how do we make the West and individual rights and, and free market attractive to the rest of the world, not building fences and trying to trying to do sanctions and, and restrict flow of goods. I, I'm very much a free market person. And I think that you need to go back to, to the benefits of the free market and not not say, oh, this isn't working, so we're going to create sanctions and, and tariffs and new industrial policy that ultimately is not is not beneficial to the rest of it. Well, that would be um, an enlightened view of it. The problem, and this goes back to the early part of our discussion today, is that over the past few years, uh, we have become, or we have revealed ourselves as isolationists not only isolationist, but anti-Chinese in every way you can think. And, 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 um, and I, it's both, side, both sides of the aisle. It's not, it's not, one, it's not one element of American uh, political world. It's both sides. I'm aware of one story of a, a Chinese immigrant who has been mercilessly attacked in the Midwest. And uh, it's by, I know it's, you know, you can see it on both sides of the aisle, but this this is a Republican attack, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's very unpleasant. It's uh, it's it's wrong. It's wrong headed, and so forth. But it reflects the movement uh, mm -hmm. that Trump established in his isolationist policies, and people are activated on this. Um, they don't like the Chinese. They will attack the Chinese. Um, they will attack all Asians, and we've seen that in you know in some of the mm -hmm. crimes. But <clears throat> how do we change the direction of that? This is a serious problem, and it stands in the way. It's a huge impediment um, to the kind of better relationship you've described. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, and and this is this isn't certainly new with me, but it is. It, 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 I think it's becoming a a more common theme in in American foreign policy thinking, and that is that. The United States, I think, needs to be much more humble in its approach to how it deals with the world. That it has to recognize that, that the U.S. primacy is actually gone, and that we need to develop, as I said, economic alliances that that actually work to benefit the rest of the world, and that will ultimately benefit the United States. And then again, uh, you you have to recognize the importance of building a workforce that's actually capable of existing in an information society. They have to realize um, and recognize the diversity in the country, uh, encourage the diversity, um, deploy the, the diversity to the workforce, as you suggest, um, and uh, generally um, act like we talk. We're looking forward, not backward. Yeah. Uh, looking as to be a global citizen, not an isolationist country. And um, I, I hope we can get to that. And I, I hope that whatever happens in November, it, it takes us there instead of backward. Do you agree? Oh, I agree. And I think that's, and I think, you know, what we've seen in the last month with, with the, the Harris campaign is exactly that message. You know, and I think that's why you see as much excitement on the Democratic side now is is that they see they see Kamala Harris as looking toward the future, as 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 some some prospect for for the future rather than trying to rehash old grievances and and old old uh, old ideas that come from old men. It could be a time of great enlightenment, Carl. Yeah, not wood. And then we can talk about how we treat our immigrants, how we how we actually solve our immigration problem rather than. Making it, making it a problem. Well, thank you, Carl. It's been great talking with you as always, and I hope we can circle back and continue the conversation uh, with regard to China and other places in the world that deserve our attention. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Aloha.